Good morning, Cancun! Well, uh, I hate to bore you, but for those of you who don't like pictures of dirty, nasty mouths, uh, avert your eyes. Uh, for those of you who get off on this kind of thing, um, you're gonna love the next couple slides. Uh, my very first day in clinical practice, I met this 16-year-old named Derek, and I walked into my operatory. I was left alone in an office with six chairs and two hygienists going full speed. God bless the hygienists. And I walked in, I was way behind schedule, and my assistant said, just go in and do a periodic oral evaluation, which means a checkup. And I thought, well, okay, I can do that. So I looked at the kid's x-rays on my monitor. He had no cavities. Uh, I didn't look in his mouth yet. Uh, he had no cavities in his mouth. He had no existing restorations in his mouth. And before I actually looked in his mouth, I said, dang, Derek, you have got fabulous teeth. I wish I had teeth like yours, because when, when I was your age, I already had two crowns. And he said, well, that's cool, dude. And I said, that is cool. But you know, I got to look in your mouth anyway. So I put on my mask. I leaned him back in the chair. He parted his lips, and I saw that. And I whispered words under my mask that I can't repeat in front of my grandmother. How is it possible that this kid who's 16 or 17 years old, who clearly has not picked up a toothbrush in at least a week, because he's got bacterium growing in colonies the same way they look on a Petri dish, how is it possible that this kid doesn't have tooth decay? So I said out loud, I was like, Derek, you've got fabulous teeth, but I have to teach you how to brush like a dentist. And at that moment, a light bulb went on in my head and I went, that could completely destroy everything that he's done. He's got good stuff growing in his mouth that is preventing him from getting cavities. Yet his teeth are fuzzy and they're coated in plaque. How is it possible this kid with plaque all over his teeth doesn't get cavities? That's what we expect to have happen when you have plaque growing uncontrolled on your teeth. You get rampant tooth decay. But we know as, healthcare, or as oral healthcare professionals that sometimes people grow tons of plaque on their teeth and it doesn't turn into caries, dental caries or tooth decay, it turns into calculus or tartar. Now for the oral healthcare professionals in the room, I'll just pose a question to you. Why do you think the patient lost this tooth right here? Was it due to caries? No, it was due to periodontal disease. But yet clearly this patient has a problem removing plaque from their teeth, but that plaque is not causing the patient to get cavities, that plaque is causing that patient to get periodontal disease. Well, we knew this already. We knew this because thank you very much, Philip Marsh, for telling us about the ecological plaque hypothesis, which isn't that all plaque is bad. There's good plaque and there's bad plaque. But what happens is there's an ecological shift that takes place all because of pH. And when the pH of the mouth changes, you start to grow organisms that like to live under that pH. For example, um, if you have an acidic mouth, you're going to grow organisms that like to live in acids. If you have a basic mouth, you're going to grow organisms that like to live in bases. And consequently, organisms that like to live in acid are cariogenic. They cause cavities like streptococcus mutans. Or if you have uh, basic loving organisms, they don't cause cavities. They cause calculus to form on your teeth. So what I'd like you all to do today, just we're going to do a little hands-on portion here. It's going to be completely unscientific, uh, especially because most of us were eating and drinking during the break. But at the end of each table, I have some packets of pH strips. Pass them down. Go ahead and pull out two pH strips. Uh, and uh, when you do this, you're going to be putting these pH strips in your mouth. So if you have a problem putting litmus paper in your mouth, uh, don't take two strips. Just uh, sit there in silence and don't bug the person next to you. Um, so here's the deal. When your mouth is at rest for about 20 minutes, I meaning you're not thinking about food, you're not thinking about Starburst, you're not eating Jolly Ranchers, you're not sucking on xylitol lozenges, or you're not, eating, you're not chewing on spry gum. When your mouth is at rest, you have a very, a very little saliva in there. Now that little saliva, in my opinion, is probably the most important saliva in your mouth. That's our unstimulated resting saliva from the minor salivary glands. And what we want to do is we want to test the pH of those secretions. Now, those of you who have eaten anything or to even taken a swig of water in the last 20 minutes, your readings are going to be way off, but still just do it anyway. So if everyone has a piece of pH paper, just don't try, to, don't go like this. And you don't want to test that saliva. That's not the saliva we want right now. So swallow all that. Get rid of that stimulated saliva. You're left with unstimulated saliva in your mouth. Kind of work a little bit up to the, for, to the beginning, front of your mouth, grab your pH strip, just stick it in there, the uh, colored, colored squares down, lick it a little bit, pull it out, and compare it to this color chart. Now, we don't know what the, if the color is correct on this, but if you look at the bottom, the bottom little square, you have two squares on that piece of paper, right? If the bottom square is like a lime green, you're probably down here in this acidic range, below 6.6. .6. 
If the bottom square is a darker, like a forest green, or it starts getting grayish, blackish, blue, you're probably in good shape. So you can kind of compare it, but like I said, the color's off here. Just look at that bottom square, and if the bottom square is a lime green, you're kind of acidic. The bottom square is a dark green, you're not. Now, here's the deal. If you have some xylitol gum near you or some xylitol candy, pop a, pop, pop a couple pieces in your mouth for a second. We're gonna test your pH in about 10 minutes after I talk about pH. So here's the deal. How many of you have ever started a saltwater aquarium before? Okay, well, if you ever start a saltwater aquarium, you will know that you can't just put a whole bunch of fish and coral into an aquarium and get it to grow. You actually have to nurture the growth of those organisms. So you start off with putting water in the aquarium, then you add some coral rubble sand, then you add some live rocks, then you start to add some organisms, and you, you watch what happens as the ammonia levels spike in your water, the nitrate levels spike, and the nitrate levels spike, and then eventually, after a little bit of time of just letting all that, that aquarium just reach equilibrium, you'll wind up with a wonderful environment that can support life. And I like to think of the mouth as the tide pool of the human body, because it's really what it is. So what's interesting is in my saltwater aquarium, I've got three fish. I've got Siphon, she's a girl, she's a false percula clownfish. Her husband Squirt, that's his little tail right there, he doesn't like to have his picture taken. Siphon and Squirt had some babies. Uh, we had a little Finding Nemo moment at home. We don't really know what happened to them. I assume that Nancy ate them, um, which is interesting because Nancy is more of an algae eater, more than a, a baby fish eater. But I've invested $31 of my hard-earned money on fish. And yet, in order to keep those fish happy, I had to invest almost $1,000 in saltwater testing supplies so that I could understand the environment in which these organisms are living. Now look at this. I can test the, my saltwater for the phosphate concentration. I can test it for the calcium concentration. What are the two most important ions in the human mouth? Calcium and phosphate. How many pages in dental supply catalogs are dedicated to testing patient saliva for calcium and phosphate? None. None. There's one test available on the market right now for us to use. One test. What's the most important thing you test in your saltwater aquarium every single day? In fact, you have a pH meter set up to your aquarium so that you can test the pH of your water constantly throughout the day because pH drives every single reaction that happens in a saltwater aquarium and every single reaction that happens in the mouth. That's why as oral healthcare professionals, we had to sit through general chemistry class where we learned a lot about pH and it scared us, right? Now, how important can pH really be in the mouth? It dictates everything. It dictates bacterial growth patterns. That's my research. It dictates salivary protein function because every single salivary protein that you have folds at an isoelectric point, which is the pH. Uh, it dictates enamel dissolution, but you knew that because we know that bacterial acids break down teeth. We know that pH dictates intrinsic enzymes within the teeth, which I'm going to talk about just a little bit just to whet your appetite for dental nerdology. Uh, and it actually dictates nutrient acquisition by oral bacteria. Um, so just to get everyone on the same page with pH, We've got a pH scale that goes 1 to 12. It actually goes 1 to 14, but let's not split hairs. Um, in the acidic range, we're below 7. In the basic range, we're above 7. There are four measurements that we truly care about as oral healthcare professionals. They are, at 6.8, that's the ideal pH for salivary enzymes to fold properly and protect us from pathology. At 6.6, .6, that's the ideal pH range for karyogenic bacteria to function at full metabolic efficiency. When the pH falls below 6.6, .6, those bacteria get turned on. Now, I don't mean... <laughs> Valentine's Day turned on. I mean, turned on at upregulating cell surface proteins. At 5.5, tooth structure will start to break down that has no fluoride in it. And at 4.5, no matter how much fluoride is around, that tooth structure is still going to break down. Who knows the name of that equation? That's right, it's the Henderson Hasselbach equation. It tells us that the activity of the solvated hydrogen ion is equal to the acid dissociation constant plus the logarithm of the concentration of the conjugate base of the acid divided by the concentration of the conjugate acid. Remember that from college? Yeah, so let's just simplify it. Let's just all agree on the Lewis acid base there. The pH is equal to the number of protons that are present in, in whatever medium you're talking about. So if protons are hydrogen ions, that means the more protons we have, the lower the pH, the more acidic it is. We have a lot of protons, a lot of hydrogen ions. We have a very acidic pH. Now, what's really cool is that the oral bacteria in your mouth use pH in order to drive all of their metabolic processes. Uh, I know this is a difficult picture to, to see. There's some little black dots here. They used to be blue dots. But um, one time I was giving a lecture with my good friend Trish, and I kept, they were blue circles, and I kept calling them blue balls. And I said, watch the blue balls, watch the blue balls. And at the end of the lecture, I think it was Trish, who said, you might want to change the blue balls. <laughs> And uh, so I changed the lecture, kept the joke. Anyway, um, 
So we have bacteria that are living in plaque. And if the bacteria are living in bad plaque, that plaque is acidic. And so that plaque has a lot of protons in it. Well, what's really interesting is that the cell walls of these bacteria are permeable to protons, meaning that over time, the protons in the environment will diffuse down through the cell wall and go inside the bacteria. Now, that, what's interesting about that is now everything has reached equilibrium. You have the same concentration of protons outside that you have inside the cell. That's a problem for the bacteria because if the pH inside the cell falls below 6.6, all of a sudden the metabolic processes are going to stop because those enzymes that create those, those metabolic pathways don't fold properly. So you can't have metabolism happening below 6.6 .6, except at pH 5.5 the tooth starts to dissolve. So how is it possible that this out here could be pH 5.5 inside the cell can be a much higher pH at 6.6 .6, if we know that the protons just diffuse down across the cell wall? Well, I'm going to put some pretty colors to it to explain that phenomenon. So, for our uh, molecular microbiologists in the audience, like uh, Dr. Martin Hanfield, you're going to hate this picture because it oversimplifies it, but uh, for the rest of us, we'll all understand it when we get done with this. You have a high concentration of protons outside the cell. You have no protons inside the cell. You also have some nutrients out here, like sugar. Every time a proton diffuses down across the cell membrane, it's going to bring in nutrients with it. That's called proton cotransport. What's really cool about that is that's unique in the bacterial world to oral bacteria. This is the way fungi get food. This is the way plant cells get food. This is not the way bacteria are supposed to get food. Now, once inside the cell, you have the same number of protons outside the cell that are inside the cell. We have equilibrium. No more food is coming in. So the bacteria turns the nutrients into ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Everyone remembers that from biology class. Adenosine triphosphate then is going to get broken down by the ATPase enzyme on the cell surface. It's going to get turned into ADP while it pumps out that proton. And look what it's done. It's reestablished a proton gradient, and now the bacteria can bring in more nutrients. So we now understand that if you, under, if you analyze how much ATP is in the biofilm, you know how bad that biofilm is. Now, what's going on inside the tooth, you have bacteria sitting on the surface of the tooth. They produce some acid. Those protons diffuse down through the crystalline lattice structure. They strip calcium and phosphate off the tooth. You start forming a cavity, which is just simple inorganic chemistry. But once those protons hit the dentin of the tooth, the middle layer of the tooth, something truly magnificent happens. No longer is it inorganic chemistry, it's biochemistry. Now, what's interesting is that bacterial acids don't actually destroy the inside of the tooth. They destroy the outside of the tooth, but they don't destroy the inside of the tooth. It's actually the tooth that breaks itself down at this point, because acids don't break down the middle, the middle portion of the tooth, because that's made up of collagen. Now, collagen is not destroyed by acids. For example, if you want to break down collagen, you would use something like Nair. Now, I stand before you today. We're all, we've all traveled to Cancun to spend a couple days together, and I feel close with some of you. Not all of you yet, but most of you, by the end of the couple days, I'll feel very close to you. So I'm just going to share with you something. I suffer from a horrible, horrible affliction known as shoulder hair. Now, my grandmother thinks it's sexy, but I disagree. Um, so, for those of you who have never put nair on hair, um, let me show you what happens. Now, don't worry, don't, don't, I see someone averting their eyes, don't worry, it's my leg, okay, it's my leg. So when you put nair on your hair and you leave it there for a little while, eventually some of that hair becomes squiggly. And then if you leave it on there long enough, all that hair becomes squiggly and you can scoop it up into a goo ball and wipe it away and you're left with this beautiful hair-free surface. How does it do that? That's amazing! <laughs> well, it does it because inside the nair you've got calcium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide, two very basic products which actually break down the hair because bases break down collagen, not acids. So how is it possible that acids produced by bacteria can break down the tooth? Well, they don't. Those acids break down the inorganic part of the tooth, but when you start to hit the living part of the tooth, the dentin, you actually turn on enzymes within the tooth called matrix metalloproteinases, or MMPs. MMPs are what actually destroy your teeth. They're your own enzymes that are living in your dentin, and they destroy your tooth when the bacterial acids hit them because they strip off this little zinc cofactor right there. When the bacterial acid strips that zinc cofactor off, that enzyme becomes activated, and it degrades your tooth. Whoa, that was a really quick introduction to clinical cariology. Um, bottom line is, this is a pH-mediated disease. If we can control the pH of the mouth, we can actually decrease our incidence of caries or increase our caries resistance, so to speak. So, looking at this patient's mouth, for all the oral healthcare professionals, you're, you immediately want to do a caries risk assessment on this patient. 
Now, Carrie's risk assessment tells us what's the likelihood that a patient's gonna experience a cavity in the next couple years. Looking in this patient's mouth, this is Victor, um, the best predictor for future cavities is previous cavities. Have you heard a more asinine statement? Um, if the best predictor for cavities is the fact that you've had cavities in the past, then that's a bad predictor for cavities in my opinion. If the best predictor for a heart attack is that you have a heart attack, you should have been looking for something that would be a better predictor. Well, traditional caries risk assessments tell us that if you have more than six filled surfaces, you're high caries risk forever for the rest of your life. So looking in Victor's mouth, he's high caries risk. He's got lots of filled surfaces. He's always gonna have a problem with cavities. The, in my practice, what we do is we start analyzing the patient's saliva to find out why they got to this point. When we analyze Victor's saliva, we find out that the pH of his unstimulated saliva is about in between 7.25 and 7.5. He's got a great bicarbonate concentration. This is another test you can do. And he's not growing the most virulent form of strep mutans that we know of because I don't see a band here on my monoclonal antibody test that I can do. So when I look at Adam's mouth, um, or excuse, Victor, his name is actually Victor Adam, so I call him Adam. Um, I tell him to go home and take this can of pH strips with you and I want you to test the pH of your mouth throughout the day for a couple days and come back and bring your data in. Most dentists look at me and go, no patient's gonna do that. My patients do. So he comes back and has more information. He brings me this whole chart of all his pH measurements and over the course of two days, every time he checked his pH, it never fell below seven. Well, if the pH doesn't fall below 6.8, his saliva is protecting him from tooth decay. And he doesn't fall below 6.8, he doesn't even fall below seven. He's got a really healthy mouth. So what the heck happened to him? He sat for nine different board exams. For those of you who don't know what that is, in order to get your dental license, you have to find a patient that has a really tiny cavity and you have to fill it with a beautiful silver filling, actually a couple of them. And then if you do it well, you can get a dental license. Well. He's been a boards patient nine different times, and every time a dental student found a little tiny cavity, they drilled it out and put in a big old silver filling, and now we look in his mouth and go, he must be high caries risk. Well, yeah, he is high caries risk because he's got a lot of filled surfaces he has to take care of. His virgin teeth would have been much easier to take care of than those fillings, which is why it's so important for us to understand the health of the mouth. So let's check your pH now after you've had a chance to snack on some xylitol. Take another pH reading and see if your pH shot up. Usually, if you suck on uh, xylitol or you chew on xylitol gum, uh, your pH goes up because as you stimulate salivary flow, the pH of your saliva goes much higher. In fact, it should go up to about 7.8 if you've been stimulating your saliva. Now, it doesn't always work for every patient. There are different systemic diseases that actually play a role in this. But moral of the story, if the pH of your saliva does not fall to an acidic level, you're gonna, you actually have some immunity against tooth decay. And so with that, um, you've had a chance to look at your own pH twice. It's, it's much better to do this a couple different times throughout the day rather than just right now and this with the color chart is not on there or is not really quite that scientific. But at least you got a chance to see uh, if you're at risk for cavities right now. Because right now I can tell you, if you've been chewing on xylitol gum and you're down here, we got to do something else to make your saliva a lot healthier. But keep eating the xylitol because when you, think of, when you think about how xylitol works and it prevents the attachment mechanism for these bacteria and it raises the pH, think about the patient who has chronically low salivary pH that we can't actually raise. Maybe they've depleted all the bicarbonate reserves for some reason. If you have that patient with acidic saliva and they're consuming xylitol, I already showed you the bacteria using that pH gradient to get nutrients. And guess what nutrient they're gonna bring in in that low pH environment? They're gonna bring in xylitol. They bring in xylitol, they can't stick to the teeth and they fall off the teeth and that's why pH is so important. Those patients with low pH who are high caries risk, which any patient who has a low pH in their mouth is a high caries risk patient in my, in my opinion. If those patients are consuming xylitol, we're basically getting, we're encouraging the bacteria to take in more xylitol because they're using that low pH to get nutrients inside the little cell walls. So with that, I'm gonna say peace be with you and thank you for letting me spew forth about tooth decay for 20 minutes. Great job, Brian. You're welcome. That was incredible. I know you have a question, though. Well, I do, actually. Uh, you mentioned that uh, I just want everyone to appreciate uh, the importance of what you're saying because the, uh, a big takeaway is, you know, when you show that picture of that one gentleman up there with all the fillings, that is what we call in dentistry the downward spiral. The minute you invade and destroy that tooth structure, 
It's never going to be, no filling on earth is ever going to be as good as the natural tooth. And in the...